welcome to today's Spud Smart Innovation Series webinar. My name is Ashley Robinson, and I serve as editor for Spud Smart. And today, I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is how to maximize fungicide and reduce costs by learning how spore trapping greatly impacts fungus disease management. I'd like to take a minute to thank for AIR Program for partnering with us on this Innovation Series webinar. Our presenters for today's webinar are Dave Bell, an agronomist from New Brunswick, Christian Lebeau Jacob, who is a microbiologist, and Daniel Mondor, Sales and Marketing Director for AIR Program. In today's webinar, you'll learn how spore trapping greatly impacts fungus disease management and how to reduce your operating costs. There will also be a demonstration of how an analysis is processed, and Dave Bell will speak about his experience with the Potato Belt Network program. During this presentation, you'll likely have some questions. Dave will be answering questions during a live question and answer session following the presentation. Please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar and indicate they are for him. Daniel will be available during the webinar, I mean, following the webinar over email to answer any questions you may have. And Christian is online and can answer any questions you may have through the chat function. Please indicate questions are for him. There will also be live polls running during the webinar for you to answer. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at sunspart.com following this live event. To start off the webinar, we would like to play a short introduction video. Agriculture today is not like it was in the past. 47% of parasitic diseases are due to mold. All molds are present in the air as detectable spores. At the dawn of this millennium, the AIR program offers an ideal solution, analyzing the air above the fields for improved pesticide management. This Quebec potato grower and his family had more to gain than to lose. They tested the AIR program on parts of their field and still continue to use it. The weather station and the spore traps are part of AIR's mobile equipment. We'll take our sample here. Super simple. Everything you need is here. At the beginning, we provide basic training for using the equipment. AIR samples are collected three times a week, ideally in the morning after the dew. We use a trap like this one. In 15 minutes, the air sample is collected and sent to the lab for analysis. A report is delivered within 24 to 48 hours. The idea of identifying spores prior to them showing up in the field is a very good idea. The analysis allows an early detection of the pathogens so that we can make a targeted response with a fungicide or in some cases, no application at all. Without forgetting that the reduction in unnecessary pesticide applications can reduce soil compaction, soil contamination, and other human health and environmental concerns. Through the harvests, producers gain confidence in the efficiency of the AIR program. The results are not long in being felt. The sprayings decrease and the quality of the harvest is improved. AIR upscales pesticide management. There are also economic impacts like lowering pesticide, labor, and machinery costs. For this producer, no other tool is like this one. With all the data collected, he can forecast the arrival of pathogens, allowing him to better manage his sprayings. We're using uh, this air analysis technology with this uh, spore traps, and that gives us opportunity, if we consider there's a risk, then we can intervene and we can do our applications of, of fungicides. That's a, a great advantage. Now he has true peace of mind. Once collected, the data is verified by a team of microbiologists. Their role is crucial. Accredited in air microbiology, they can count and identify mold and spores. They have grouped them in a reference manual, which producers and agronomists can consult for more information. Thanks to spores, many diseases can be scouted with precision before they become a problem or before they make their way into the fields. This is true for a number of crops, onions, berries, potatoes and grapevines. Vines are particularly sensitive to disease caused by airborne spores. We have this pressure common to all vintners because we are in environments where disease is present. 
These are the three main diseases, mildew, oidium, and botrytis. We must remain vigilant. Following a fungus invasion, losses can be major. I can easily lose half my crop. So prevention is important. Detection is important. Detection is no longer simply a visual assessment by the vintner as he tours his vines. There are tools and technicians in our industry that allow us to perform disease scouting. Spores will stick on the slide. The question I get every week is with what treatment, what strategy do I have to work this week? Should I go with systemic treatment or a fungicide? We'll use the air system in order to develop an appropriate strategy and decide whether or not to apply a treatment. All this data is very interesting, but it's useless without the use of air software programmed by microbiologists. Its algorithms generate an accurate report of the upcoming situation to make an informed decision. AIR can help forecast the onset of a disease up to a week in advance. And we receive them on a nice detailed report. We receive it on by email, it's on your laptop, on your phone. It's very, very, uh, it's a user-friendly uh, type of uh, a tool to work with. The report summarizes the risks associated with pathogens and weather conditions. At this point, the producer or agronomist can modify the application of fungicides, delay sprayings, and even avoid applications during the season. I've been able to rely on the results. Uh, they're easy for me to make a decision whether we should be uh, putting on a fungicide or not. For AIR, sustainable agriculture is second nature. Managing the invisible for visible results. With the AIR program, producers have never been better equipped. Entrust your fields to our spore traps monitoring. Contact our team for a service offer based on the mapping of your fields and according to your needs. AIR. Less pesticides, more savings. Daniel, please take it away. Hi, guys. I hope you're doing well. Thank you very much for being with us this morning for this AIR program webinar. Uh, I would like to thank first uh, SpotSmart uh, for having put together uh, the webinar and having their, um, their support as well uh, to promote it. Uh, it's always a pleasure for us to share information about uh, our great uh, program, uh, which is a fungus disease detection program, which includes uh, spore trapping as well. Uh, as Ashley mentioned earlier, uh, our mandate is to protect your crops and to reduce your operational costs. AIR uh, has patent in Canada and USA. Uh, with over 100 sites in North America. It's basically the more used uh, spore trapping program in North America. Uh, the program is composed of two tools, uh, which is spore trapping again, and a weather risk indicator. It's important to know that we are not against fungicide. We just believe that we can use them as per needed. Um, we are 100 percent independent. Uh, we are a uh, microbiologist, so we never uh, indicate what to do or not. Uh, as well, we have agronomist partner that can support and help in uh, decision taking. Uh, let's start with spore trapping. Uh, it's a great measuring tool to uh, quantify the invisible, actually, uh, and in order to include that information uh, in a global strategy. We need to know that uh, spore trapping exists since the 40s. Uh, back in the days, it was not possible to use it on a daily basis because uh, the report were available only after a week or a week and a half. So it was an information to know about, but not necessarily usable on a daily basis. Uh, with the program we have put it together, uh, which is uh, AirSpore, 
uh, we can provide the uh, report, so the information within the 24 to 48 hours, which make the operation viable and being able, we are being able to use that information on a daily basis uh, and also include that in uh, the uh, fungicide management strategy. Uh, just to go over the program, we sample three times a week because we have to know that a spore needs between four to seven days to develop as a disease. Uh, if we had the five to seven days to be able to see foliar traces with scouting, uh, we we talk about a preventive program uh, program with something like a week and a half, two weeks um, prior uh, evaluation. So this solution is a revolution because uh, it's definitely a great tool to fight fungus disease, uh, to fight it efficiently. You know, uh, it support concrete action that producers agronomist and other uh, group can use uh, and it gives the possibility to act accordingly to scientific data. As I mentioned earlier, we almost have two weeks uh, prior uh, to the disease, which is a great uh, help. Uh, the action related to uh, the, the program are uh, different and several, you know, because we can act earlier with having that information. It helped also to choose the proper fungicide. Uh, it can help also to delay in some time, some sprays, and even for some producers being able to skip some uh, spring. Again, we are not promoting to skip fungicide uh, application, but again, working with that information, informing about the needs, definitely help to adjust and to adapt fungicide uh, management strategies. Uh, it's allowed also to take science into your strategy. Uh, with this measuring tool, uh, we talk about scientific evidence. Uh, this is, you know, important information you have to put in the mix, you know. And it's also helped with image uh, to transformation company as well as end consumers. Uh, let's see right now uh, an important element, which is the fungus diseases development triangle, because you will understand how spore trapping definitely elevates fungicide management. So as you can see on the left, there's three important elements to consider with fungus disease, which are the crop, the weather condition, and the pathogen. And as you can see on the right, the classic weather model most of producers are using right now, it's quite limited because it don't take in consideration pathogens in the mix. Uh, we always suggest to combine tools as well. So most of our participants are also using classic weather model. But again, using only the classic weather model is really limited. Thank you very much. So with knowing if the pathogen is present, definitely inform and uh, provide uh, information about how we should process and which strategy we should use, you know? So you, we can see, example, we can see sometime a uh, weather condition, high pressure, uh, but if the pathogen's not there, you don't hack the same way. Uh, knowing that the pathogen's there without the weather condition, again, you can hack accordingly, accordingly to the real needs. So, uh, all these elements have to be taken in consideration for a proper evaluation, because again, the classic model is really uh, limited. Uh, let's see now uh, the kind of report we provide, again, three times a week over your cell phone or our platform. Uh, this is for potato as well, 
we can see four fields. So we cover for Pareto the most, I mean, the four pathogens the most important. We talk about as well airborne pathogens, uh, phytophthora, which is late blight, early blight, steam rot, and great mold. Uh, you can see on the right the two tools we provide, which are the spore trapping. So you can see the actual in white in quantity, which is the sampling information of the last sampling, as well as the two previous sampling. Why? Because for certain pathogen like early blight, there's always some spores in the field. It's when you see a major increase that you have to be alert. You have on the risk, the risk column, the actual, which is the weather risk indicator uh, as per the last sampling and the previous, which is the day prior to the sampling. It's really uh, easy to use. There's green, yellow, and red, again, depending of the level of pressure and danger. Uh, so uh, these two tools, uh, sport trapping and the weather risk indicator, are definitely a great advantage in fungicide management strategies. Um, and it's all included. We also uh, include weather station. The, the data, the weather data is always uh, also available uh, for the producers or the different uh, stake, uh, stakeholder to get. Uh, we also, uh, and we will show you like in the next minute, a quick video showing the analysis process and also the pump. It's really important because the pump uh, we use is a mobile pump. Uh, the reason we use mobile pump, it's really uh, easy. It's because we take the wind in consideration for having like the most proper sampling possible. And also we do the sampling right after due in the morning, which is the most uh, dangerous correlations period for these sports. Uh, if you have any question, uh, feel free to contact me via my cell phone or my email. Uh, it will be a pleasure for me to redirect you to the rep of your region and also be able to answer any question you may have. I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. And let's go to this quick uh, lab video. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christian Jacob and we'll use the next 15 minutes to talk about methods we use and, and why we do the things uh, the way we do. So uh, first of all, as you may now know, our main goal is to give producers and agronomists reliable data on which, uh, with which they can work uh, to uh, minimize pesticide spray or um, in certain instances, justify their use whenever necessary. In order to do that, we provide information on weather data and the risk of disease in those weather conditions. And perhaps most importantly, we provide information on the concentration of spores present uh, for targeted disease that are uh, released in air. So um, first of all, what is a spore? Um, so a spore is the like the pollen to a plant. Uh, in fact, molds have many features uh, comparable to, to a plant or a tree. Uh, they have mycelium, uh, reminiscent of the roots of a plant. They have a stalk, uh, branching patterns, uh, fruiting structures that hold cells uh, or, or spores in that case. Uh, and those spores are uh, released in the air and responsible for the dissemination of the fungus. And that is where we can uh, intervene by uh, capturing those uh, microscopic seeds before they actually cause damage. Uh, this is giving you a window of uh, opportunity to act and, and prevent the disease to take foothold or to progress. So uh, when talking about disease prevention programs, uh, to be usable, a prevention method must have specific uh, characteristics. It must be uh, simple and reliable, assess risk uh, throughout the season. It must be easily uh, usable in rural settings and offer a quick turnout. Uh, and these desirable aspects were kept in mind along the development uh, process of our program. So uh, when, when talking about uh, spore collection strategy, uh, we knew early on that we wanted to ally spore trapping and weather data analysis to have a, a complete and precise picture of, uh, of what is the, the actual disease pressure in a specific field. So uh, a number of options are avail available for spore trapping. Um, the spore trapping devices are divided in different categories depending on how they operate. And there's a number of trapping designs in each uh, category, each with their own uh, specific pros and cons. Uh, here, I just represented a few that are uh, perhaps the most used or most uh, recognizable. Uh, so first of all, spark collectors can be described as passive or volumetric. Um, passive traps are defined by uh, the fact that they rely on uh, either inertia, gravity, or winds uh, to operate, mainly winds. Uh, they have the, the big advantage of being very inexpensive. Uh, they also offer continuous sampling without uh, assistance. And um, the main drawback is that it's uh, extremely variable. Uh, its efficiency is, is uh, extremely variable because of the fact that it, it, it relies uh, heavily on winds. Then. Um, Volumetric uh, sampling spore trap, uh, for their part, use uh, mechanical pump to set to a precise flow rate, and thus we know precisely the volume sample. This means that these uh, sampling tools have known air volume and measurable efficiency. They are uh, also less dependent on weather conditions. They uh, allow for continuous or uh, targeted sampling. And perhaps the main drawback uh, is their propensity to overload, and we'll cover that uh, in a few minutes. Then traps can be stationary or uh, mobile, meaning that they either use equipment that remains on the ground or uh, equipment perched on a fixed pole, uh, or in the other case, equipment that can be carried out, carried in the field and uh, placed wherever need be. So. Uh, for example, if you have a field such as the one highlighted uh, here with the uh, dominant winds blowing uh, southeast, you would likely place your uh, stationary and mobile spore traps on the southeast edge of the, the, the field to sample 
in order to uh, sample air that passes over the field, uh, giving you a chance to find uh, spores of interest that comes from afar or, or uh, from your field. Um, but if we tweak the wind direction just 45 degrees, uh, it, it gives a much different result. The uh, mobile spore trap will be positioned at the optimal uh, spot, but the stationary sampler uh, misses most of what passed uh, over the field. So although it's cheaper, uh, more traps and more anal analyses uh, are necessary to achieve the, the, the same work. So uh, to us, the, the best strategy seemed to imply using a mobile and a volumetric uh, sampler. Uh, I won't go into more details on why uh, these devices and not others in the category because of the time constraints, uh, but let's just say that we went for a simple and effective. Next up, um, when thinking about spore sampling and uh, most importantly about real-life situation usage of uh, data derived from uh, spore sampling, uh, turnaround time is absolutely critical and is often uh, overlooked. Uh, the time frame between spore deposition and disease can be quite small. Uh, as you can see here for uh, uh, late blight, it can, it can be as, uh, as soon as four days after spore deposition. So uh, agronomists and growers must receive their reports within this uh, time frame. So a useful uh, sampling calendar that has the grower's interest in mind uh, must involve harvesting samplers or going into the field to take samples every two to three days at most. Uh, this give, gives us uh, one, two, or perhaps uh, three chances to uh, detect the disease before it becomes visible by uh, traditional uh, scouting methods or, or before it's too late to, uh, uh, to do anything. Then we did touch on the, the propensity to overload with the samplers we decided to use. Uh, this actually forced us to think a little bit differently and uh, allowed us to be even more uh, efficient with uh, disease detection. We went back and studied the dynamic of spore release and spore viability, uh, mainly for late blight, but for other diseases as well. And uh, after looking for ways to mitigate uh, this limitation of our sampler, we realized that, of course, uh, it actually, it's actually better to massively uh, sample within the window of time where the spores are released in masses and are also viable uh, than sampling throughout the whole day. Uh, for example, this high spore concentration release for phytophthal and pestans uh, causing late blight uh, usually occurs in the morning uh, after the, the dew dries up. Again, for the analysis uh, in the lab, we made sure to keep things as simple as possible. Um, while I, I'm a big fan of biochemical methods and PCR protocols, and I have personally used this technology in just about every research project that uh, I've ever done, uh, and they're great tools, uh, but to make sure that our process did not rely on cumbersome and expensive equipment and sensitive regions, uh, we went with identification by microscopy uh, with a cleverly designed spore trap that simply encloses a uh, microscope slide. Uh, so it only requires one person, uh, his or her microscope, and about 10 minutes of the, their time. So again, I don't want to go too deep into details, but we gather as much information as possible through uh, microscopic observation and by comparing key uh, traits with uh, known species from the scientific literature, uh, we can assess if the spore of interest are present in the sample or not. Uh, at first glance, this method can seem very challenging given the, the thousands of species of fungus that releases spore in the air, but luckily for us, uh, potato pathogens are, uh, for the most part, uh, quite easy to identify by those means. Now the weather aspect. Uh, spore uh, analysis by itself is an incomplete story, just uh, as weather assessment alone is also an incomplete story. Uh, much better than, than nothing, but still incomplete. 
so to have this disease, of course, you need the presence of a host, the pathogen agent, as well as favorable uh, weather conditions. So all those traits are, are uh, equally important. Uh, there are two main ways of uh, approaching weather data, uh, forecasting and uh, simply uh, condition assessment. Uh, so for uh, forecasting, in reality, uh, forecasting of disease and spore trapping are, uh, for the most part, uh, two measurements of the same phenomenon. Uh, models estimate the likelihood of occurrence of each of the many steps uh, leading to uh, spore germination and plant infection. So those models are often used on their own without spore trapping. Uh, because we are physically there uh, three times a week uh, to trap spores, uh, we shortcut all those variables and, and estimations that are quite complex to manage uh, to verify uh, if the spores are there, and, and then we simply assess if the weather conditions present on that given day and in previous days were adequate for, uh, for disease. Then uh, one last point that I wanted to touch is the establishment of thresholds. Uh, while it's very tempting to use specific breakpoints over which an action would be required, uh, there are still uh, way too many variables for any threshold to be usable. Spore density, although a crucial data point, does not correlate with disease severity. It does correlate with disease presence uh, in the field or, or in the area around the field, but, but not necessarily with uh, uh, severity of the disease. Uh, so any, uh, any given number of spore detected uh, is a consequence of, of many variables, uh, canopy density, wind speeds, uh, host susceptibility, soil composition, uh, hair, air humidity. Um, so, of course, for some diseases like late blight, uh, one spore could be considered one too many and trigger an action. Uh, but for early, light, uh, early blight, uh, presence or absence and trends over multiple data points are probably more what should drive your actions. Uh, rather than, than one specific number. Then, although there are many more subjects uh, to cover and a lot of information to discuss uh, around those points that we touched today, uh, I hope that this quick uh, overview got you all thinking perhaps a little uh, differently about sport trapping and all the variables that come into play. Uh, please do not hesitate to send in your questions via uh, email if needed. And I thank you all for your time. Take it away, please, Dave. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a little bit about uh, the use of the program uh, in the in New Brunswick and uh, eastern eastern side of the of North America since uh, 2017. And what we were looking for is to use measured data to determine the best course of our action for both the crop and the environment. So we're looking at the determinant of the relative amount of pathogen in the air and not just the presence. And this is going to help our growers, extension staff, industry consultants utilize our fungicides more effectively by choosing the right product for the right time, re potentially reducing the number of applications to just what are needed. We've seen this triangle a couple of times, and this is uh, what we're looking for here is we're looking for the pathogen. We spend a lot of time um, looking at what weather and, and weather predictive models. And here we want to focus on the presence of the pathogen. Most in, in integrated pest management, we get to count uh, what we're going out to control, whether it's weeds, insects. Uh, we count, we scout, and uh, we decide whether we have a threshold to make action. Of course, early and late blight, they exist in the microscopic world and beyond our aided perception. Um, before they show up in, in uh, foliar symptoms and then, uh, and then we're in trouble and too late. So the need is to perceive these diseases earlier so we can make the best and appropriate action to, uh, to control them. So as, as uh, Christian was saying, uh, spore trapping is not new. This is spore trapping, what we think is done better, active air sampling versus the passive collectors using that specific volume of air and to be able to quantify the measurement. 
identify the spores very quickly, and then communicate the location, number, and type of disease found. And our plan here was to get this to all growers in Maine and New Brunswick within 24 hours so that everybody can make better decisions. Our potato growing area is a bit unique where we have both uh, uh, the, the same valley and the, a lot of the same conditions on both sides of the, of the Canada-US border. So we were looking to identify the disease sooner so we can make better decisions and give better advice and choose the right control options. And combine that with the weather-based models. They don't work independently, they're, they're dependent on each other. So in New Brunswick and Maine in 2016, we began with uh, just a few air samples being taken to, to test the viability of the, of the equipment. Then in 2017, I set up 10 different New Brunswick locations. We sampled three times a week for eight weeks during the season. In 2018, we used the same 10 New Brunswick locations, three times a week sampling, but we expanded out to 14 weeks. Through this, we noticed that uh, we really are lacking in data from, from the west of us in, in Maine. So, uh, approaching uh, friends in Maine to get involved. In 2019, uh, we were able to double the number of locations in New Brunswick to 20, and then we, in, we were able to add 10 locations in Maine, most in Aroostook County. Uh, in 2020, we expanded up to 29 locations in New Brunswick and up to 13 in Maine. These were a combination of program-funded sites, sponsored sites, and then also grower-funded sites. We took all of the information from, from each of these collections, and this is why we call it a network, and we put all that information together and share that with everybody. So these are the sites in 2017 and 2018. 2019, we added the sites in Maine. We also added some sites to the north of, of New Brunswick up here in St. Quentin. And here at this point, we noticed that we have a bit of a lack of sites down in the south of Maine. So in 2020, we did a bit of a, a removement of the of the sites and spread them out a little bit better. So now we have more coverage down in the southern part of Maine, and then good coverage from the north to south in uh, New Brunswick. So what we did is that uh, AIR did the, the, the sampling and uh, every, every second day the results were sent out. They came to me and we organized the data, wrote a short report, a report on the findings, and then the spore capture findings and the report were sent to Potatoes New Brunswick, which is our uh, grower organization here, where they were translated and uh, emailed out to all growers on the contact list in uh, both French and English. The same information is all shared uh, in Maine. Jake Dyer of um, here, it's uh, he, he's with the Maine Potato Board, organized the data and uh, wrote the report and sent out all the Maine growers. So within 24 hours, all growers in Maine and New Brunswick received the same spore capture information. A short report. Uh, begins and then this is the, the uh, full list of all of the, the data and we just keep adding to this each week so that you can look back to the beginning of the season and see trends. Here we're showing the early blight and late blight counts. It's all done by location. So we see the top 20 locations in uh, New Brunswick and then the bottom ones in Maine. What we've seen over the years is in 2017, this was the last time that we saw late blight in our area of the country. Uh, the network reported late blight spores 14 days prior to the first field reported case. In 2018, 19 and 20, there was no late blight spores found at any of the collection sites in Maine or New Brunswick, and no cases of late blight infection in potato fields were, were reported. Early blight spores now are found each year and are spiking several times a season. And the early detection helps growers choose the right option and save unnecessary spraying. This is some of the early blight um, spikes that we've seen from 2017 and 2018. 
similar timing, but, but different each year. In 21, we plan to expand the network to more sites in Maine and New Brunswick. Uh, spoke with Jake and he is working on, uh, on the, the program for, uh, for Maine this year and we're also in New Brunswick. Uh, we're looking to improve reporting with online platforms being developed by AIR and continuing to use Potatoes New Brunswick and the Maine Potato Board to distribute all the information to all growers on both sides of the line. We are continuing to try to improve our decision making and do our best to reduce unnecessary applications while protecting our potato crops from disease. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Dave, so thank you so much. So first off, maybe I'll just kind of ask a, a general question. You, um, from what I can see on your presentation, you had some really good results. You guys are getting stuff a bit uh, earlier detected than in the past, but what have you guys been hearing from growers after they've been receiving these reports? What have their thoughts been on um, uh, this information? Okay, in um, surveys done by AIR um, sent out to the growers who have utilized the program and asking them, uh, do they use the, the information to help make weekly decisions on fungicide applications? And uh, I believe Daniel can give a, a better indication of the number, but a high percentage of growers indicate that they look at the spore capture data and it helps them make the right decision for fungicide that week. Um, in the case of specialized fungicides for early blight uh, versus late blight, um, I know from my experience that it's, it, it definitely helps to time these, uh, these specialty, specialty fungicides uh, to when we're seeing the spikes in uh, early blight spores. So, um, yeah, absolutely the very good grower uh, feedback that uh, we have from the program. Thank you. And um, to everyone listening right now, make sure to remember if you have any questions for Dave to get them in the chat box and we will ask them now. So our next question is from Gord Penner and it says, in the years when you found no late blight spores, were you able to get away with no late blight fungicide applications? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that's a very individual choice um, that growers make. I mean, as an agronomist, that's a difficult recommendation to make. Um, but it has certainly allowed growers to make, um, with confidence, uh, bolder decisions on in a seven to 10 day program to be able to stretch a fungicide application out um, and certainly towards the end of the season to, um, to stop fungicide applications when the risk is, is very low. So yes, it does reduce the number of applications um, by lengthening the, the, the spray interval, uh, and, but it's a very personal decision made by growers. Certainly, it is, it is helping with um, using the, the, the more specific uh, fungicides, whether it's systemics or, um, or super fungicides, for want of a better term, and using them at the right time in the right place. And in the case of low risk, to, uh, to go to the, the least expensive and uh, options that are available. So, Thank you. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, if you allow me to uh, intervene, uh, and thank you very much, Dave, it's definitely the approach we have. Uh, but just for you to know, uh, as per the survey we made from last season, uh, the average, uh, I mean, for most of the average producers in New Brunswick region, they have been able, and again, uh, it depends of many factors, but with the weather condition we had last season, the average producers saved or skipped between two to three application. But again, it's something really personal uh, and it has to be in a certain conditions. Thank you very much. Thanks both Daniel and Dave there. I really appreciate it. And just a reminder too, if you have any more questions for Daniel, his email and cell phone information is right up there on the screen. And I know he would love to chat with you. Our next question comes from um, James Lee and it says, if you're using protectant fungicides, do you have time to react to finding phytophthora spores in your field? And I'm sorry for my mis mispronunciation of that Latin name. Dave, do you have an answer for that? Yes, um, 
Well, when you're using protectants, um, generally that's on a seven to day, seven to ten day program. And when we see blight spores uh, begin to come in, yes, you do have time to react and to to change to a sporicidal uh, fungicide or uh, a more aggressive fungicide in the case that the risk has has increased. So knowing that it takes um, you know, seven to 10 days, uh, perhaps a little bit longer for a late blight spore to, um, to germinate and to begin to form a lesion. Um, now that would be when that first lesion first appears in the field. And then how long does it take before a scout or a worker would have discovered that, that uh, disease? So let's say easily a couple of weeks from the time that the spore first came into the field until it was perceivable uh, with unaided eyes. So yes, I, I believe that we're we're ten to fourteen days ahead of the game by being able to find those those spores and make an appropriate application. Thanks, Dave. I think this one kind of plays into kind of what your end of your answer was there, but I just thought I'd ask it just in case, in case you have any clarifications. It's from James Lee again. It says, do you know how long it takes from the first spores of phytophora infestans being found and the first symptoms of di disease in a potato crop? Yes, and that's, that's in that uh, uh, four to 10 days um, for the first spot to begin to develop, but then it's then it's the next delay from the time that the lesion begins to develop and we then we get to see it. And uh, that that is dependent on, on how heavily your fields are scouted and how closely they're watched. So I think it can easily be 14 days um, from the time that the spores are, are in the field until it's perceivable. Okay, that looks like all of our questions. So thank you so much for Dave and Daniel and Christian for all being here. We really appreciate it. And I just first off like to also thank Air Program for making this webinar possible. And a big thank you also goes out to everyone who participated here today. I hope you have found this information valuable. Again, a recording of this webinar will be made available on spudsmart.com uh, shortly. And thanks again, and we hope you have a wonderful day.